Gahan of uh, Memphis, Tennessee, and our local council here in Little Rock, Deborah Sawings. We represent uh, petitioner Damian Eccles in the case of Eccles versus Norris. Eccles versus Norris is a federal habeas corpus uh, petition proceeding in the Eastern District of uh, Arkansas here in Little Rock, arising out of the 1994 trial, trial really, of three teenagers, uh, Damian Eccles, Jason Baldwin, and Jesse Miss Kelly, who were tried and convicted for the murders of three eight-year-old boys, Steve Branch, Chris Byers, and James Michael Moore, in 1993. A federal habeas corpus petition is a proceeding sanctioned by the laws of the United States and the Constitution of the United States, which gives a state prisoner someone deprived of their liberty and especially a state prisoner who has been sentenced to death, as Damien Eccles has, the opportunity, after state proceedings are completed, to go into federal court and uh, file a petition complaining that their state trial did not accord with the Bill of Rights, the Federal Bill of Rights, the United States Constitution, which guarantees things like the right to counsel, the right to confront witnesses against you, the right to present a defense and the right to 12 impartial jurors. To some people, these sound like technicalities, but since 1789, the founders of this country recognized that the only way to tell the difference between a guilty person and an innocent person with any reliability is to give them a fair trial. The case in front of the district court, therefore, is primarily not about guilt or innocent. It's about whether the proceeding in Mr. Eccles' case was fair. But due to a quirk, perhaps we'd call it an exception in federal habeas corpus law, there are cases in which the threshold question for the court is, is there in evidence, sufficient evidence, to establish that someone is actually innocent of a crime? If, if that evidence exists, it means the court can proceed in a different kind of way to consider all of the fair trial claims that the petitioner brings. This is a case filed on Monday in which Mr. Eccles presented evidence of actual innocence. Actual innocence in a legal sense in the federal court means the following. It is new evidence that was not available at the time of the offense. When you view it with all of the evidence concerning the case, would a federal judge then be able to say with confidence that any reasonable juror would have a reasonable doubt about the defendant's guilt? To state it differently, is it the case that no reasonable juror would find the defendant guilty beyond a reasonable doubt? And a third way, can the judge be confident that with this new evidence, if that defendant were tried today, he would be acquitted? And we are here today to discuss the evidence that establishes that no reasonable jury would convict Damien Eccles essentially knowing what we know today. The heart of this presentation is four experts who we will be calling today who are among the, the experts who provided the core of the new evidence uh, before the district court. They are uh, uh, Werner Spitz, uh, probably the country's leading forensic pathologist, certainly the author of the, the, the Bible of forensic pathology in, in this country. Uh, Richard Souvron, a, uh, a renowned forensic odontologist, who was the key witness for the prosecution in convicting Ted Bundy uh, some years ago. Uh, uh, Tom Fedor, who is a DNA expert to discuss the new DNA evidence, and John Douglas, who had headed the criminal analysis unit of the FBI for 25 years. Um, and we will move to them as quickly as we can. But I think in order for anyone uh, to have a full sense of the impact of this evidence, they have to have some context about what happened, what led to the arrest and conviction of Damien Nichols. And uh, uh, once the experts have concluded, we're going to try and move through this in a systematic fashion. There's a lot of uh, information to get out to you. We will throw it open for questions and answers, but we will ask that, uh, that we complete all of the experts' presentations before that begins. But let me begin in 1993 with the arrest of Damien Eccles. 
Evet. This is AIG. Good evening, I'm Brian Davis. And I'm Tony Brooks. In a statement given to police and obtained by a Memphis newspaper, 17-year-old Jesse Miss Kelly allegedly confesses to watching two other suspects choke, rape, and sexually mutilate three West Memphis second graders. Jen Newton reports. According to the published report, Miss Kelly told police he watched 18-year-old Damian Eccles and 16-year-old Jason Baldwin brutalize the children with a club and a knife. The report says Ms. Kelly told police Eccles and Baldwin raped one of the boys and sexually mutilated another as part of a cult ritual. Ms. Kelly is quoted as saying he did not take part in the rape and mutilation, but that he helped subdue one victim who tried to escape. At a press conference, Inspector Gary Gitchell said the case against the accused teens is very strong. Scale of 1 to 10, how solid is the case? 11. <laughs> It appears satanic worship may have played a role in the murders. Since the very beginning of the investigation, people all around West Memphis have come forward with stories of satanic cult. So everyone in the state of Arkansas had been informed beyond any reasonable doubt, 11 on a scale of 10, that Davian Eccles choked, sexually violated, and mutilated the victims beat the boys with a knife in the club as part of a satanic cult ritual. The only problem is that the statement of Gary Gitchell that convinced the citizens of this state that it was true was absolutely false. He knew, he had to know, that then as now, there was not a single piece of credible evidence that tied Demi Damian Eccles to these crimes. The two pieces of evidence that existed at that time were a statement by a woman who was facing embezzlement charges that she would play detective, find out what went on in this case. She knew Miss Kelly, and she told the police that as a detective, Miss Kelly had taken her with Damien Eccles to a satanic s -bat. Her name was Vicki Hutchison. What do we know today about Vicki Hutchison? Every word was a lie. A complete fabrication, a product of police pressure to get the results in the deaths of three children. That's one piece of evidence. The second piece of evidence, of course, was the statement taken from Jesse Miss Kelly, which any objective observer at the time would know could not possibly be true. Miss Kelly was borderline retarded. He was told to cooperate. He could cooperate. He knew there was a reward. He was told when he said he wasn't involved in satanic activity that he had failed the polygraph on that question. He didn't fail the polygraph. He said that he met with Eccles and Miss Kelly and marched them off, uh, marched the boys off. He took them off their bikes while they were on their way to school at 9 o'clock in the morning. At 9 o'clock in the morning, those boys were in school, as they were all of that day. He said that, and this is is just so telling. We debated whether we were going to show you the proof of this. It's a picture of these three little boys bound with their shoelaces, feet to hands, in a tortured position. The police tried desperately to get Miss Kelly to describe this. And finally they said, well, well why didn't the boys run away? If, if they were tied up in a way that he could run away, he said, oh, they could have run away, we hit them. No human being. No human being who has ever seen a photograph of those three boys could say that they were tied in a way that allowed them to run away. And Ms. Kelly said they were tied with brown rope. No one could not know they were tied with their own shoelaces from their sneakers. He said and you, uh, one victim was choked to death. Absolutely false. None of the victims were choked. The victims were sodomized. Even in 1994, the state's pathologist said you cannot rape an eight-year-old boy if you're an adult and not leave overwhelming physical evidence of it. There was not one bit of evidence that any of these boys were sodomized.